Okay, good morning, guys. Um, we are now busy with one of the last topics of the semester. Um, however, um, please do consider this one of the most important topics, um, not just for your test five that's coming up, but as well for the exams in November. Okay, so we're looking at corporate governance. Um, you should have uh, basis for corporate governance coming from your second year of studies. So a lot of this should be a bit of a recap and then just a refresher, but do remember that this is very, very important. Okay. Okay, so you have your resources. Um, I just want to highlight a few things to you. There is additional material available on e-learning um, with respect to uh, summary of booking for and then summaries of the NAM code that's also um, available on e-learning, as well as the differences uh, between NAM code and King 4. Okay. We will talk about um, what NAM code is, because this might be the first time that you hear about NAM code, but it is, um, it's a similar corporate governance code to the King code, but we will look at it in detail as we progress through the slides. Okay. Okay, so you have, um, Dynamic auditing as well as your textbook. Okay, you can refer to chapter two, um, and there's some uh, pages in um, the textbook that you can refer to. Okay, I've already said that there's differences between NAM code and King three that's also available on eLearning. Okay, so if we're looking at corporate governance, um, the history of corporate governance um, goes way, way back to the 1800s where businesses started to expand. Um, if you think about a farmer or a farm owner, um, previously farming was basically just um, for sustainability. Um, the farmer would farm just for himself and his immediate family, um, whether it was crops or he kept animals, um, cattle, or sheep, goats, whatever the case may be, chickens, pigs, um, for the, the sustainability of the family itself. Um, however, now when um, farmers begin to expand, okay, uh, buying a second farm or a third farm, just think about the implications, what that would mean for the management of the farm. Um, that would then mean when this farmer could not be at two or three places at the same time. Okay, so they um, he needed to get a farm manager, okay, or someone who would be in control of the second or the third farms, okay. So they that created that's just an example of the of the separation between ownership and, and control, where uh, the farmer would be the owner of the entity, but actually the person who controls the the farm would be then the farm manager, okay. So. The farm, the farm owner may have certain ideas of how he would like the farm to be run, okay, and he required like certain principles and certain values in the management of the farm, and then he would have to obviously communicate that to the farm manager, and that is where the development of a code of principles or practices come from, okay. It wasn't always codified, it wasn't always, um, in written form. Okay, but there were certain set of general principles. If you think about just um, where you uh, the the principle uh, of your word is your honor, that where you make a deal and you give you when you make a promise, so that level of integrity has always been around and required in the management or the governance of an entity. So as time progressed, these Principles were then uh, codified or written up, and that is what um, a code of corporate governance um, has resulted from right now. That is what we have come to know as a code of corporate governance. Okay, so the more corporate scandals there are, um, the more the realization that an entity is um, responsible towards all of its stakeholders. We call that the stakeholder inclusive approach, and that just means that this whole process of uh, corporate governance and is revised as we um, as we progress and more things come to light. Um, these codes need to be revised all the time to take into account these changing circumstances as well. 
Okay, so this is just um, an international scandal, WorldCom. It happened in 2002. These are some of the details you guys can read up on this uh, in your own time, as well as the waste management scandal. Um, in South Africa, a little bit closer to home, we had the Steinhoff scandal um, a few years ago, um, where there were accounting irregularities. Um, this is still ongoing, okay, um, where this case has not been finalized yet. And then even more closer to home, on the Namibian soil as well, we have the GIPF scandal, where they had um, unaccounted investment funds, okay, to the tune of around 600 million uh, NAM dollars, um, the AVID SSC, or the Social Security Commission scandal, and then obviously about two years ago, 2018, we had the SME bank failure, or 2017-2018, we had the SME bank failure. And then even more recently, we had the Bishot scandal, okay where there were bribes paid to obtain fish quota. You guys must have probably all seen the documentary, the Al Jazeera documentary, Anatomy of a Bribe. Okay. So these are just scandals that illustrate the need for uh, corporate governance, uh, good corporate governance, and then the application of a code of corporate governance. Okay. Um, the necessity thereof. Okay, so the corporate governance principles, you should be able to remember this. These are the four pillars of corporate governance, um, and especially the key four. Fairness, transparency, accountability, and responsibility. Okay, so they're interlinked and they go um, together. Okay, they should be seen as a whole. So the different parts of the whole are then these four segments. Okay. Okay, so King 3 has obviously been updated, okay, to King 4. King 3, I think, was applicable from 2009, and then King 4 now from 2016, it was um, released, and then effective for year ends after 2017. Okay, so because of uh, the globalization and the, the trend of having uh, uh, subsidiaries and associations across multiple borders, um, the need arose to have a corporate governance code that could be applied across different jurisdictions. Um, so it, it also entailed a whole process of more inclusivity and integrated thinking where we include all of the stakeholders, the needs of all of the stakeholders, not just the shareholders who might be interested in profit maximization, but the community and employees, for example, as well. Um, this resulted from the movement of integrated thinking as well. We have obviously um, a change in IT environment, artificial intelligence, different types of technologies, e-commerce booming, climate change, um, the need for transparency, and then obviously from 2020, the new buzzword is work from home. Okay, so we have a whole new way of working and that way of working and that way of doing business needs to be managed in a whole new way and that is a whole different way of governance okay okay so in terms of the nam code okay so the nam code is a code of corporate governance as we previously discussed um, but it's a code that was developed by the nsx um, they work together with the Institute of Directors in South Africa, in Southern Africa, and they developed this code of corporate governance based on King Three principles at the time, but it was adapted for the Namibian business environment. Okay, King Three was selected as the basis because it was internationally recognized in that at that time, uh, and it was sort of the go-to code in Southern Africa at that point, okay? And because of the affiliation between South Africa and Namibia, um, the fact that a lot, a lot of Namibian companies are subsidiaries of South African companies, um, selecting the King Code as the basis um, was considered relevant, considering that um, as a group, then overall, the Namibian companies would have had to 
uh, adhere to the King code as well. Okay, so we've already said that the NAM code was issued by the NSX, the Millennium Stock Exchange. Um, it is effective from 1 January 2014. Um, it has not been revised as yet. Um, a revision is due, but this has not yet taken effect. Um, so for any year end of a Namibian company starting uh, post 1 January 2014, it is still effective. It is applicable to all entities, so it, irrespective of the incorporation status, so whether it's a trust, a CC, or a company, um, it is um, applicable to those entities, but it is mandatory, it's compulsory for the companies that are listed. So for NSX listed companies, um, as part of the NSX listing requirements, um, the application and the adherence to the NAM code is part of that listing requirements. Okay. So, the NAM code follows an apply or explain approach. This is similar to the King 3 approach, um, seeing as the King 3 was the basis for the NAM code. Okay. So, from 1 February 2018, the NSX issued a directive to state that uh, any listed company then has the option of either applying NAM code or King 4 at that point. Okay. So, remember, King uh, NAM code is based on King 3. Um, so they have the option of applying NAM code or then the mo the latest King code, which is then King 4. Okay, so if we look at King 3 versus King 4, or the changes from King 3 to King 4, we said um, similar to the NAM code, the NAM code and King 3 are similar. Um, King 3 followed an apply or explain approach. Okay. So you would apply the principle and if you cannot or you would consider it irrelevant or not feasible, you would then explain okay, why you are not applying the principle. Okay. But King 4 assumes the application of all of the principles to all entities. Okay. So all entities can apply King 4. So you would have to explain, um, you have to apply the principle and explain how it was applied and why it was applied. Okay. So once again, it's regardless of the form of incorporation, okay, you can apply King 4. Okay. It is principle and outcomes based rather than rules based. Okay, so an entity should follow the principle and explain how they have um, given effect or implemented the principle, which practice have they instituted so as to apply the principle rather than uh, a tick box approach of saying yes. We have no, we have not. So it's not a rules based approach. Okay. So King 4 um, has a more, uh, like we've said before, stakeholder inclusive approach that has, it places more emphasis on the roles and responsibilities of stakeholders and to stakeholders. Um, and this is not all stakeholders, whereas previous codes of corporate governance would have followed a enlightened shareholder approach, which means, um, the shareholder or the owners of the company, they were sort of seen as the preferential stakeholders and the other stakeholders not um, receiving or being perceived as important as the shareholder. Okay. So King 4 um, focuses on fair, responsible and transparent remuneration. Okay. And the application of King 4 needs to follow a mindful consideration approach. Okay. So King 4, we said, was released in November 2016 and it's effective for all year ends commencing 1 April 2017. Okay, so prior to that, the uh, King 3 was still applicable. Okay.